post-game show where we talk about GMing. And we've got uh, got a little bit of a structure going here today. We're going to do an intro for a couple minutes. Then we're going to talk about what's going on at our tables. Uh, we'll talk about a, an issue that's come up. It, someone needs our help where we run gallantly to, to aid them and solve all of their problems in less than 40 minutes. <laughs> and uh, that's going to be about low prep GMing. And then we're going to talk about what we're into, where we each uh, vomit for two minutes and uh, sometimes literally. On and camera. talk about talk about things that that are excited about, you know, that we're excited about in gaming. Uh, we've got JD Corley and we've got Rich Rogers and we also have Eric, the Iron GM here. Hello, yeah. Eric. Hey, everybody. Thank you for coming, Eric. Yeah, I'm stoked. I love doing this stuff. Cool, man. You seem to be the ideal person for this topic too, so I'm really psyched to have you here. Yeah, let's hope I don't flub it because that'll look really bad. <laughs> <laughs> if, if the best of the gaming community got ain't so good, it wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> for, for, for those who don't know, Eric, tell us a little bit about about this whole Iron GM thing, because I, I think you, you need you deserve some chance to brag. I about can this. I can I can uh, give a quick summary of it. Uh, Iron GM has been through a couple iterations, but in its final form, it's went like this. Um, there is roughly fifty to sixty players, one GM per six people. And we are given three secret ingredients. So one year it was uh, Rock Sasha, River Rapids, and Redemption. And the GM has one hour to prepare a five-hour scenario with people that you do not know. And then after that, um, you start running. Players have an hour to make their guys, and you have to go. And the players judge you on these three ingredients. And then there's other questions, and they call it a, a, a Russian-proof scorecard. But you go through and you basically get judged on how well you can run a game. I've been doing it for I think it's going on nine years now. I've placed in the top year for uh, top three for the last nine years. I've never placed lower. And then the last two years I've taken first place. The first time was the first ever perfect score, and the second wow. time I was one point away for a perfect score. Now apparently the, a guy in Calgary and the regionals just got a perfect score, and he's going to be a Gen Con this year. But nice. I would say wow. every person who has come from a regional to compete. I think only one or two have placed ever. They usually get trounced because it's a totally different environment. That's like playing t-ball and then going to play the major leagues. <laughs> so uh, it's it's been it's crazy. We've had GMs walk out, quit, stress, cry, you name it. It's been it's a wild ride, and it's loud, and it's uh, almost done in a circus meets um, WWE rock fashion. Like there's intros and music and lights and spotlights, it's its insanity. And I, I don't ever prep. So I get my hour, I go downstairs to the bar, and I drink for an hour, come back up, and then I get my words. I don't even know my words. I just leave. I don't even want to know. And I sit down at the table, read my players in about five to ten minutes in character interaction, and then I take those words and go with them. Eric, is there a place where I can get a t-shirt with your face on it? To wear uh, yeah, I made <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. I haven't, but I should do that. I do make, I do make the t-shirts for Iron GM. I've done some really crazy t-shirts for them. Um, I've been doing it for all the regionals and stuff when I'm not there, and I just did this year's as well. I do because it for free they, for them. I just I like doing them, and they all look like uh, old school metal t-shirts. There, there is an aspect of GMing that I feel like we don't talk about, where in order to GM, you're kind of probably the best GM out of your friends. And then you go to a con, and you're kind of looking at the other GMs and sizing them up. We don't admit that we do, but we totally do. And this plays into that. Like, it plays into the, the unspoken e like ego of, of GMing oh, yeah. that is totally there. Uh, some of the nicest GMs I've met there, and there's a lot of us that have some big egos, and I've, I'm known for it on purpose. There's, <laughs> there's actually a table that one of my buddies was at, and the girl goes, I hope we don't get that Eric Frankhouse guy. And he's like, why? He didn't say that they know me. He's like, it's just got all that swagger. Well, that's because that's the year I brought in a paper golem with a like magic eight ball style tearaway sheet stuck it in front of the table. And I said, any questions you have, because you can't talk to your tables during that hour, any questions you have, pull it off. That's your yes or no's or answers to whatever you ask it. And I left. I went and drank. And uh, she was she was annoyed by that. And then I won that year, which was really, really fun. So <laughs> she was she was pretty mad. That's um, funny. But, yeah, it's a good time. Like I, I love it. I think if you haven't awesome. done it, you either need to do it as a player or you need to do it as a GM. If you have you know, the balls to do it, do it as a GM. Oh, I want to do it. 
I play as a it. player because you're going to get some of the best games you've ever had. Or you're going to get the worst ones, and you're going to get the ridicule that guy for running a horrible game. And or hopefully he, he gets better and comes back. Here's what you I get say. a good story either here's, way. Here's what I say. Here's what I propose. I propose all of us do this in 2014. All of us. <laughs> I'm going for a hat trick this year, and I told them I was going to retire. And then until somebody else gets a perfect score at Gen Con, I'm not coming back. But they're all mad. They want me to stay. So I don't know. You just, if you, if it's you all like hard. It, you it's a, it. There's a big show. There's a big show with it. Like I threw a guy downstairs one time for my opening. Um, my, my my buddy does stunt work, so it's not like it was just a random civilian. Right, right, right. <laughs> and then we were up on the balcony. We actually got a fist fight. Well, Roan didn't record it. One of the guys running it. He just stand, stood like this with the camera at his side because he thought people were fighting. Nice. And there's some other guys coming in with, like luchador masks. It's crazy. Cool. Uh, Segueing into uh, what's going on at our tables. Uh, <laughs> what's what what's going on at your table at home, Eric? Um, well, let's see. I run my own world and. Um, but I do run some other stuff once in a while. We've been trying some new things out. And the biggest problem I have is uh, structured-based games, like really rigid um, 3.5, 4th edition, Pathfinder, all games my table loves. Uh, but they are known for making a background or maybe not making one, and they don't have no narrative. They don't join in. Because in those games, you don't get the lovely stuff that you get with indie games. Right. There's no narrative-driven focus for them. So I've, I've been changing that up, and um, I make a short synopsis, and I hand them out to the characters and say, hey, you can do whatever you want. Just grab them, and I want you to build a character around that synopsis. But also with that synopsis, and they're usually in little envelopes, there's two note cards, and they have a secret on them. And it may be like, for example, there's a, a guy who was a ranger, and his son died, and his uh, he's got to make a character based around the death of his son, and he could be a hunter, and now he's kind of went back into hiding. Well... The secrets say it's his fault his son died because it's one of the bear traps he set up. And the, the other secret is he's never told his wife it's his fault. And then there's one blank card that says make up your own secret, nobody knows. And I use those as ways to drive narrative because when I mention a bear trapping game or somebody else gets hit by a bear trap because you know I'm going to make that happen, uh, they always jump in. And before they wouldn't, they would just kind of go, well, I have these feats, I can do these things, I can make these checks. Right. This kind of takes them out of that boundary box and, and brings them in. But uh, it's worked really well. Like it kind of adds narrative to a game that doesn't have a narrative, or, or I should say, mechanic for narrative. Cool, cool, cool. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, you know, that's interesting. That's a cool, the um, cool idea. There's been a lot of games that have sort of been down on the idea of character secrets being kept secret by the players. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think there's a lot of good tension that can come from that. But you know, I, I'm always thinking back to like my my LARP experiences where we would have an extensive background and um, that was fine because you would use that background in your own head and 90% of LARP is player driven so anything with that was in your own head had some impact on play right but like you, you would go a year in the game with a secret that you and the GM knew and you would work so hard to get make sure nobody knew it but by doing that you also made sure that it had no impact on what everyone else was doing. That's the difference between a LARP, I think, and a tabletop. Um, when yeah. you're doing a tabletop, you have a GM that is still running the idea of the story. This allows your players to help generate that story. And also what happens is, as a GM or, or a storyteller, whatever it is, you make sure that that comes into play. And when you bring it into play, I find that the players, especially the ones that are used to playing a, a regimented game, feel like I have some freedom. There's things I can do, and there's rules not restraining me. It's a rule I made with the GM. You know, my, right. my wife doesn't know that my child died. And uh, that comes into something good. I actually turned that woman into a villain later on because well, I mean, of what happened. Hold on, because there's something really important about the way you're crafting those secrets, and we're not, we're not talking about it, and it's, 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 it's really different than, than what I feel like JD is talking about. Um, I think there are secrets, I think poorly crafted GM secrets that, that players have are secrets that the players need to other players need to know in order to do stuff. Correct. That's poorly crafted. The way you're right. crafting secrets is you're crafting secrets that cause them to do things that the other players can interact with. So it doesn't matter if anyone ever finds out about their, that guy's son. No. That does, it, it creates an emotion for them. Right. It creates a drive yeah. for their character that, that is not based on D20s, D12s, yeah. rage... And things along those lines. It creates a drive for them to do something other than what their character sheet would say. Nice. Works great at conventions, actually, because uh, there's less rolling, and it actually drives the story faster. 
Uh, I've done uh, I've done a situation where we had uh, pre-written secrets, but they were open, meaning that all the other players knew them. Mm-hmm. And I kind of just put it in. And this was in wasn't quite a con game, but it was sort of close to that. It was a small sequence of game sessions that we were going to play. It wasn't going to be a campaign forever. And one thing I said was, absolutely none of these secrets can be discovered by other players. Like, nothing they do is going to discover it. I will okay. re- perhaps be able to reveal them, but you will never be able to, to uncover them. Hmm. Um, either me or the player that has them, I should say. So all right, I, there you go. But I believe that secrets in, in, in all game development, and, in, and I did video games, I worked for you know, Volition and other companies for a while, secrets um, have a power behind them, in real life right. and in gaming. And if you open them up and let everyone see them, it's no longer a secret. Now it's just knowledge. And I want people to be worried about, like, you know, if this comes out wrong, I'm going to look like a bad guy. How do I make sure that this is, you know, it's a mistake. It's a secret, but it's a mistake. I don't want my kid to die that way. It was, it was an accident. He was young. It's like a kid firing a gun the wrong way, you know, or, or using a bow right. wrong and, you know, shoots the window out of his house. Well, I mean, and, right. and, and actors, actors do that. Actors, yes. So sometimes actors will have a secret that they don't tell anyone else during the shoot, during the play, during whatever. Maybe never. They, it's just something that drives them from within. Like I remember Tom Hanks was talking about uh, his character in uh, Saving Private Ryan, and uh, he talked about how he has a, a secret for every one of his characters. That and it's just another simmering layer under him. And uh, the interviewer, I think it was James Lipton, said, uh, "You know, what, what was your uh, secret about that character?" And he said, "Every night he writes a letter to home to his wife, and then rips it up and never sends it." Exactly. <laughs> it, 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 I was but like, it's smart. Dag. Yeah. Nice. It's smart. So, and, and in, that's, in the that's open really how secret, I do that. In the open secret game that I was describing, the, the, what that added, though, was a layer of sort of dramatic irony. So, for example, one of the characters was a secretly a noble. Like, this was supposed to be a, a ragtag group of fantasy adventurers, and one of them was secretly like a princess of the realm. And what that did was, like, suddenly instead of this princess of the realm just being a background NPC that nobody remembers, suddenly everyone has an opinion about her. Like, and they're asking the person who is secretly that person or giving that person their opinion. Don't you think the nobles spend way too much money on themselves? Yeah, me too. <laughs> or, or someone else would be like, ah. Oh, that princess is so beautiful. I I wonder what I would be able. I wish I would be able to talk to her someday and tell her how I feel. <laughs> and just like all of these things that could never happen if it wasn't an open secret. Like if if it was a closed secret. Right, right. Those interactions don't happen. The the um, the, the players get to set up volleyballs where you know and and let the other players spike them a little bit. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Rich, uh, um, Rich, uh, back back when you were in college and wore eyeliner and played White Wolf games, uh, did you uh, did you have any secret stuff going on in your game? Wait, that was in college, just not now. <laughs> yeah, well, I've got a seven year old and he, he really likes to ape whatever I do. So I that's the best guy to put makeup on you for White Wolf. Oh, well, okay, that's that's true. So uh, back in college, you know, I ran a lot of a lot of Vampire, and um, I I really was running. You know, I had like seven players, and I was probably running five games simultaneously. Um, they, it was just, it, it was basically like a, a relay race for me. I was gaming for 13 hours. The seven players were probably gaming for about three hours each night because all the secrets that were going on, take one person, you know, these two, let's go into the room and do your secret stuff. Okay, I'm back. Now you two, let's go over here and I'm back. And then... Um, you know that was that was what they loved, and they had their kind of interplay in between the the relay race, and and it, and it it worked. But I, you know, it was one of those worked around it. Uh, it was it was funny though that near the end of the burnout from that, because you know it's going to happen at some point. I, I heard this really fabulous podcast that you can't you can't hear anymore that talked about just put the secrets out on the table, and it, and it. You know, it really kind of opened my eyes. Like, right now I'm playing in a play-by forum of Monster Hearts, and there's a secret that that is out there, because, you know, it's on the forum. There's no secret threads going on in this. There's nothing that's whispered. It's all on the table. And uh, my character is a foster sister of another character, and that other character knows her mom is cheating on... Uh, or is she's 
you know, a single mom, divorcee, uh, that she's uh, basically the other woman for this uh, this couple, this married couple, and the daughter of that married couple has come over and is saying stuff like, oh, my mom's just being a total bitch right now because, you know, dad's working late and, you know, he's not cheating. And so it's great because we all know that that's happening. Um, but if it were some kind of little secret that only the player of Teddy knew, it would be less enjoyable. Like, it's great. We can play to it. Like Jason was saying, you know, it, we can all play to that secret, and it's really fun. Yeah. So it's cool. I think we've, we're, we're uncovering uh, different ways you can use secrets, right? We've got we've got uh, the iron technique, I will call it. And Eric's that sounds like there's an open and close, basically. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, totally, open and close. But I think, I think we, we need to think about that technique for making good closed ones is that... It's something that isn't necessary to make the campaign go forward. Like, it's not like, where's the necromancer's castle? Your right. character knows. No, it's like it's something in the character that makes them, that, that motivates them in some weird way that gives them depth. Uh, and it's mm -hmm. not something that is needed to make the game go forward. And then with the open secrets, it's stuff that the other players can push on for each other to make something cooler. Uh, and those are different. There's, there's a... There's a there's a difference there. There's like maybe not so subtle difference there. I'll tell you what. I'm getting ready to run a Shadowrun game here coming up. That's a perfect game for that. Yeah. Um, and what I'll do is I will do a open secret that maybe is group, group wide. That's something about all of them. Maybe something that 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 group of runners had happen in the past, and that's awesome. a secret that the public doesn't know. They'll yeah. have private secrets that are more to drive personality. Maybe one or two to drive personality. Yeah. And then I will do another one, and it's player's choice. Cool. Cool. We'll see how that I'll turns out. That, yeah, I would love to hear how that goes. Cool. I think people do like having the closed, the closed secrets, if we're using that terminology. I think people feel like they have something special that's really just theirs, and it really motivates them to get into the game. So um, there's definitely upsides to both approaches. That sure. I think it's a great, great well, technique that you got. It's like all tools. There's a right time for them. I mean, mm -hmm. that's really what it comes down to. Rock on, brother. Cool. 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 All right, what's our next uh, what's our next step here, Judd? Someone needs our help. All right, I think I've got the message here. Cool, read it out. Okay, so um, unfortunately, the message does not uh, have a name on it. So... His, his name is Greg. Uh, I'm gonna blow the name probably pronunciation L A A B S. Greg Lobs. He posted this to G Plus Tabletop Role Playing Games uh, community on Google Plus. Okay, Greg so Lobs. Here's, here's what Greg is asking. Um, GMs, it's game day, and you've not done any story planning whatsoever. The current state of the campaign story, one, has no big plot hooks. Two, it's new enough that you don't have any go-to villains or threats that you can fall back on. You were planning on preparing plans for the session, but kept putting it off, and now it's too late. So what do you do? Do you have any awesome tips or resources for throwing something compelling quickly, uh, or how to run sessions that don't have a clear adventure hook yet? So uh, he actually asked for it on the day that he needed it, and now that it's several weeks later. Uh, <laughs> so He'll make that mistake again. We all do. We're already too late. <laughs> um, but what do you guys think? Like, uh, you said, uh, Eric, you just go drink and then start. Like, when you say you just start, what do you do? Like, uh, uh, Okay, there's... Uh, uh, there's a little secret. Um, I don't do any notes when I'm prepping for Iron GM. That's, it's a, that's a prime example. Iron GM is a great way to flex your hip shooting skills along with your ability to just be improv about things. I mean, it's really what it comes down to. And you have ingredients. And what I do is I'm a big big believer in plot webs. Um, and I can plot web a lot of stuff in my head, you know, where it's like... What is, my, what is a plot web? My three ingredients, let's say we'll do the Rock Sasha, uh, River Rapids, and Redemption. Uh, that year, um, I ended up making the River Rapids something totally different. It had to be ended up being steampunk ships that fly, those dirigibles, coming out of an old mountain uh, that used to be a waterfall, but now it was just air current that carried things in and out. They rode in mechanical uh, beholder-like vehicles, and I had a chase scene in it. And it was a big chase, and that was the River Rapids. And Redemption was because they all ended up being aberrations, and there was a redemption as they were leaving this place and what was going on. So I had these key points that I know I have to use. I started springing off of them. And I, I came back and I heard what the players were making as I was, you know, getting ready to go. I'm like, all right, well, they're this, this, and this. Because of these three things, one's 
One's this kind of aberration, one's like a mutant style one. I know I can take these ideas and run with them. So when I sit down, I go, I know there's a few questions I need to ask. And really when you run a game, and I think most of you probably agree, although I have a story I want to tell, the best stories are the ones that the players help create because it ties them in and makes them feel like they own something in what you're running. And any time a player can claim ownership, those are the tales and stories that get told later. So I make sure that they feel like they can claim ownership when I'm doing it. And the easiest way to do that is ask about their character. Find one thing out. Find one thing that they're big on. Like, if this dude has had this sword his entire life, or you're doing sci-fi and a guy has owned this ship and it has been dry docked five, six, seven times because of one part he can never find. Take those things and make that adventure you have to do about that player. Yeah. And tie in other people. Just because that guy needs a spaceship part, and let's say the other person who's doing this sci-fi game with you has... Uh, lost his fingers in a gambling debt. doesn't mean you can't put those two things together. And if you can merge those stories together and pick plot points from their story and their background, that's a great way to do something if you've done no prep. Because they did it for you. Yeah, asking asking questions is such a powerful, powerful, yeah. easy, easy tool. Just ask them, you know, look at their best skill on the character sheet and say, yep. who, who taught you to do that? Hmm. You know? Pride. What is your character proud of? Period. Ooh. Good one. Pride always, always gets a player. What nice. are you proud of? Oh, my guy's the best guy in Knowledge Planes ever. Oh, is he really? Right. <laughs> yeah, any kind of sin, really. Um, just uh, any kind yeah. of vice that you can come up with. Yeah. You my know, guy's also, the best auto mechanic of all time. You know, I, I think I have a, a game right now, and I've mentioned it before, that I'm sticking really closely to a timeline. Like, I'm not doing any like, skip forward two weeks or anything like that. Like, we're playing out these characters' lives day by day. So I think having a quiet moment or just some quiet time to regroup can actually be a positive thing. Yeah. Like, but to, to shift it into gear, you're going to need something along the lines of a solid description as to why things are kind of quiet. Like, it's a, it's a dinner at home with everybody together. And there's some other NPC there that puts out a provocative question of some kind. And let the characters start to interact as characters and just enjoy the interaction of those characters for a little while. Um, I, yeah. While they're yeah, working, they'll, yeah, they'll start reflecting on the things that have happened in the game and you will likely get an idea of where they want to go next. Well, I, Jason, you, you just like... Uh, Gave me a good good kind of flashback about a couple of games. Um, one was an old Legend of the Five Rings game, and the whole it was getting apocalyptic and things were going crazy. And I really wanted a uh, time where our characters could just go to a hot spring, sit naked in some hot water, and talk about all the crazy stuff that had happened, uh, and not like obsess over honor for ten seconds, sip some tea, and just like chat. Uh, and we didn't get that. We didn't get that space. And I think the game was was worse off for it. Um, on the other side of that coin is uh, Unknown Armies, where we were all like a team of badass TNI agents, uh, the new the new Inquisition agents, and uh, we would our characters would would go into therapy uh, because of all the stuff that would happen to us. And it was great. It was just a really nice breather. And it was a really nice way to give all the crazy stuff that happened weight and not just have it be Monster of the Week. Um, what suddenly, storytelling? I mean, right yeah. there. You just you did the calm before the storm. That's yeah, it. Yeah. Right before the Apex, like, everything's getting really bad. Why is it all nice? And then you yep. drop it like a hammer. Yep, yep. Um, so I think to the, so. that's one good suggestion we've got is that you can kind of downshift. I mean, if, you, if it's, this is a long-term campaign and things are in a lull, let them be in a lull. Like, you know, Ninja don't need to jump through the window every game. Like, it doesn't have to happen every damn minute. But you got to still make it enjoyable, though. There has to be a reason to yeah. enjoy that still. Well, no, I think well, th that's another technique that I'm, I'm, I'm hearing from you a lot, Eric, and I'm hearing a, I, I hear a lot from JD, is that you've got to give them enough tangible structure. Like, what JD was talking about at dinner, he's like, someone says something that spurs on something. Like, you can't just say, you're at dinner. It's roast beef. Go. Right. Like no, <laughs> you've got to be like you've got to be like you're at dinner. Your wife looks around at all your crazy adventurer friends and says, "Why do you guys go into dark holes and fight monsters? That's crazy." You <laughs> <laughs> need a new career. Like, That's what, perfect. What, what, what are you doing? And like, so just, what? Get, yeah, go, go, JD, go. 
Sure, sure. And one thing that you can do is you can build these people, and I, I understand this is an emergency question, so telling you to do things in advance is kind of like not a great answer, but I'm going to give it anyway. If you build people or organizations or even philosophies in, into your campaign world that are provocative and that do persist, right? Like if every NPC they come across just fulfills some function on the way to a goal, then you're not going to have anybody to give that provocative question to. You're not going to have someone who can give that give that question. Um, I'm thinking of uh, Smallville here. Uh, I ran a very long-term Smallville game uh, that used sort of the X-Men mythos from Marvel Comics. And one, the first thing I did in the game was this was a group of you know young mutant adventurers. I gave them a rival group of young mutant adventurers and that rival group, they would take things too far, and they were kind of down on regular humans, and they were kind of like the bad guys a little bit. They were the bad boys. And every time there was a lull, I would have one of those rivals be like, you guys are stupid. Here's what you should do, and give some dumb idea and let everybody like make wise comments about the dude for a little while. Uh, rivals are a great way to spur them into like doing something really rash. Um, which is actually how Smallville works. But, Our group um, right now does that. They make each of my players makes their own nemesis, um, and I, they know about it. And then I do an adventure that's about this player, an adventure about this player, and one about this player. And I do exactly what you're talking about, where you have that rival. But I wanted to say something about that that uh, dinner. What it really does, and this is a GM secret, maybe we shouldn't share it. When you get your players all talking to each other. Really what's going on is we're making you brainstorm so we can just not work or come up with something while you're talking for 30 minutes. <laughs> really, leveling is not about you getting more powerful. It's about us getting a break so that we can build something else for you. So if you ever get a level like three hours into your seven-hour section, your six-hour session, it's just the GM going, yeah, i got to plan some more stuff. I, I also, like, if, when I don't know what to do next, like, just to get tangibly back to the, the, the question for for uh, just a second. Um, when I don't know what to do next, I look at everybody's character sheets. And if that doesn't inspire me for something, then we, then I, I'm done with that game. Seriously. That's, that's a, <laughs> that is a cold, hard fact. Like, if, Judd, Judd, right here, I just want to look at character sheets right there. Let's see. Cool. I think you beat me to it, but I had it. I, I, <laughs> I, I mean, if, if I, if, 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 if that doesn't inspire me to create like adventure and, and spur the players on, then I'm I at the end of that game I'll be like, guys, why are we playing this game? I don't like it. It's not any good. <laughs> um, if I if I don't look at, if I don't look at their character sheets and I'm, I'm like, wow, I'm inspired to do something adventurous, then like, what the heck is on that sheet? Like, what's going on? That's um, true. So yeah, that's my that's my main tool is to look at the character sheets, um, and if if it's not working, then either something went wrong in character creation, which I think is the most under talked about GM skill is 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 facilitating character creation. Yep. I think that I mean 99% of all of our problems that's where they start. Uh, it doesn't even have to be deep and long like a really long huge con you know constructive session. It can be short and sweet and you yes. still get what you need. Yes. Look at Fiasco. Look at Fiasco's setup. Yeah. Look how deep that ends up being by the end. Even yeah. though like you love it or you hate it, it's still quick, simple and relationships are built. Yep, and and you can, if if there's not anything there, like you know, you can take the six uh, D and D stats and use the 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 DM questioning technique and and make find something interesting there. Like you can be like, you have an 18 strength. How did you get so strong? Like it's not just genetics. Seriously, what did your character do? Like what spurred them on to get so strong? Like you worked at this. Bench pressed. Right. You know, you you know. Oh well, I used to I used to carry this one rock, and my dad would you know, he would hit me with a stick until I carried it all around the castle. You know, yeah. and like, okay, now I got something interesting. You know, I mean, I think that there is something there. You just have to find the thing and ask a question about it. Yep. So listen, ask questions, listen to what they have to say, and create something from it. Yep. Amen. Yeah, yeah. I I was that's really where I would go if I wanted to stay within that game. I do have a cheat answer that I want to give in a second, but. You know, really, the Apocalypse World first session is really we need to go. I mean, look at the question. You know, he says that uh, it has no big plot hooks. It's new enough that you don't have any go-to villains or threats. 
you know, you haven't created that, so why not put that in the hands of the entire play group and just follow them around for a day? Yeah. Yeah. And, and ask questions. You know, what do you do? And it and it's it's a lot like what you were talking about, Judd, with the the kind of the de stress. It it gives you a chance to see how they exist within the world when you're not throwing things at them. And yeah, be ready for some possibility of some dead space, right? Let them think. But you're going to get a lot more out of it because the answer they finally come upon, if it is in a uh, can you just answer it for me type thing, you know, pull it out of them and then reflect it back. Don't don't say, oh, you think you're smart, you know, or oh, well, you know, you think you're the best fighter. Well, I'm going to trump you. Let it be fact for yes. now, at least. Yes. Do not when you are not sure what to do. Do not go out to teach your players a lesson. <laughs> like, that's, that's bad GMing. I know so many GMs who are into that, and I'm like, no, don't teach them a lesson. No, that's you not, back pocket I, that. I, They'll teach it themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and let let the let the dice roll where they may. Like just like, yeah, I, I like I like what Rich said about just you know let it be fact. It's more interesting Very if true. they're the best fighter in the world because that doesn't come, you know, that comes with problems. Let you know, earn it That's important to a player. Like if he can say he's the best fighter of all time, and, and he is earning that reputation, you got to think in a world, and I always tell GMs to step out of their mindset of their own story they're trying to tell, and yes. go, these guys are level 8. Do you know how many level 8 people are in the world, or these guys are this power? There's not that many of these people. Yeah. These guys are heroes. Let them be that. Let them be that Hercules. Let them be that hero. That mythology has to come from somewhere. So Why got, not let it be your players? I've, I've got a second technique that I think can be useful for, for somebody who's stuck. Um, and that is find a status quo in your world, and this is this is riffing off of Apocalypse World. Find a status quo and destroy it, destroy it. That yeah. that 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 king or wizard who's been giving them all those missions, kill him. Kill him. Yeah. Yeah. He got cancer. He's dead. <laughs> He's dead. He's dead. Some you know he died. Like his his son killed him. What the nice kid who we've been talking to every time we go in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Joss yeah. Whedon's done it the best. He's like, I am not afraid to kill a character. Yeah, because yeah. it just it drives story. Yeah. Well, let let me just throw in on that note. Um, I think the fact that Greg is asking about an ongoing campaign, like this, is something he and his group have been playing for some time. I think that's relevant here too. One thing that you can do, and it sounds like they just wrapped it up something, and they are ready to start something new, but he hasn't built it yet. I think rather than look ahead, if you haven't made those plans, you can look back at what you just wrapped up and introduce people or plot lines or even just thoughts that sort of reflect on what you just did in a different way. Like, let's say that, I mean, you don't want it to, if they were being heroic, you don't want to make it unheroic, but maybe there's some unintended consequence that now needs to be handled, or maybe someone, like, really wants to recognize them for their heroism, but to do that, there's kind of a problem that's sort of in the way of them doing that. Um... You know, there are. You can look back at what you just did and introduce a new consequence for that, either in the form of an NPC who wants to do something about what they just did. Maybe they just cleaned out, like they just cleaned out, like the evil tower of Steve the Tricky, uh, and someone comes along and is like, "You are awesome. You took care of Steve the Tricky. He was a real bastard." Um, but there's this tower out there, and it's full of traps and devilry. And we want to make that into a temple uh, to cure uh, the poor, sick orphans uh, who are throughout the kingdom. And we know that you want in on it. Uh, so, but what we need you to do is you need to share with us your maps and give us your expertise on this tower. And you need to talk to our builder and, and tell us, tell the builder what he needs to do. And you need to talk to, you know, the healers. And so now there's a project that's based on what they just did. And it's not it's not new because it's something you've already you already have all the maps for this tower. You already know about Steve the Bastard and all of his traps and devilry. So you don't have to plan new things. You just take a little bit further on in the consequence chain and do that for a session. I have something that ties into that and it's super, super sexy, and we've done this a couple times. Um, when my players give that, like if I'm starting a new session, I have nothing planned. There, like you said, you always know what you've done in the past. One of the best things I've ever done is I sat down, I gave them little sheets in front of them. They're like, "What are these?" I'm like, "We're playing out something." Like, "Well, I'll get my character now. Just put it away." <clears throat> and I gave them monsters from a recent encounter that they had to deal with, and they killed off. 
and I played the two days up until the death of those guys. Oh my god! <laughs> so that they realized not only who they killed and what they did, it drove a new story, and I and I just tied it into a new thing, and I said they had a dream about it, or they were scrying, and this is what popped up instead of what they wanted. Whatever you want to use. Nice. And they got locked into that scry for the day, or if they're doing decking, they got locked into the story for the day. And what I ended up doing is they're like, wait, we just murdered what? Who are these people? There's right. an army being built? What the hell? Wait, what's going on? And I'm like, nope, no questions. You will get those things as we play through this. We're playing monsters. And I only played it for three hours of our six-hour session. Nice. And then I told them to pull out their characters. They're like, well, we got to do this now. And that then they did the brainstorm that we've all been talking about sitting at the table. And uh, it was one of those on-the-fly awesome things. And I keep it in my pocket. I pulled it out at some conventions before, and everyone's like, this is awesome. And all you do is give a monster stat sheet with, like, an extra skill, or if they're playing something, you just give them something extra and make them personal, like, guy's missing an eye, whatever. And you go with it, because they fought these creatures, and I don't even tell them who those creatures are, or what those people are, who those NPCs are. They figure it out pretty quick. That's and awesome. I'm telling you, it's, do you want to mess with your players, and you really want them to enjoy a session because you're not prepped, super easy to do. Uh, I did that in a superhero game, but not with the opposition. I did it with the shady, uh, ominous government spy organization whose job it was to keep tabs on superheroes. Mm -hmm. So instead of playing their own characters, suddenly they're playing Agent Smith, Agent Jones, and Agent Cardholder. Awesome. And, uh, they're following themselves around and making ominous reports on their little ear earpiece. So, um, yeah, just to look... That's reimagining what you've done. That's like doing what you did again from another point of view. Yeah, yeah. Did you and have like, anything else on your note sheet there? Uh, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm writing down a lot of stuff that we're doing just so I can, like, give a list. No, I meant him. He had he hauled up a note sheet. <laughs> He's like, I well, got this, this, and this. What else you got on there? <laughs> yeah, well, I knew Jed would, would hit a lot of mine. We, we, I learned a lot from him. Um, <laughs> see, you guys show up to, like, beat everybody else. I show up to, like, watch and steal. So that oh. when I go back and talk, <laughs> this dude's writing a book. I know what's going on. I see what's happening. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't. I don't want to. Engine Publishing got all the books. They can put all the GMing books out. Um, oh, yeah, I have time for that. No, I, real quick, I have to because you guys are bragging. A Demon, uh, Demon Hunter X came out for World of Darkness, and I conned my players by saying we were running a werewolf game for a while, and I conned them saying, guys, I really want to try this out. Let's do a one shot. And they set up to the point where they fought some low-level dudes, and they were loving their new characters they just made. And they came up to a door, and there was something coming on the other side of the door, and I ended it. Next session, everybody travels to Tokyo, and they end up being the force on the other side of the door. So they're scared, <laughs> scared, 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 knowing what they're about to face. Awesome. Um, that's so cool. another thing in an ongoing game, just, just a, a quick little trick uh, I, I love is the Mountain Witch trick. Um, the Mountain Witch trick is something that I originally heard on the Story Games Forum. Andy Kikowski mentioned it. It's a, a figure comes out of the sweat house. It's a man from your past, a respected mentor. You move quickly to greet him. Who is he? Uh, it's it's a, You only kind of front load a little bit of it because, hey, maybe that's all you thought of off the top of your head, and you throw it right at them to fill in the guts of it. Um, I use it consistently now. It is a tool that I use all the time, and I'll, I can go into a scene, I'm not all like Eric, like Iron Jimmy style, but I will say, huh, I haven't seen these two NPCs, and, and we haven't really talked about this thing, so I'm going to set up a scene and, and kind of lean that way, and then I'll Mountain Witch trick a couple questions to fill out whoever else is in the room, and then it's on the player, and that buys me some time, and then I can kind of shuffle and build around it. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, smoke and mirror stall, like best thing ever. And, and, the, and the other thing that I do is that, like, if I have no plans, I look at the table. Who has not had any kind of spotlight recently? You know, who have we not focused on? That's what and, my power groups are for. Yeah, so so I'll absolutely like if if the thief has not had anything going on, then I'm just gonna spotlight the thief and say, so what are you doing? And then. Just build around that, and if you've got a good table of people who trust each other, then they're gonna they're gonna build up around that, you know. And I think I, it could really be helpful. I, I I did one thing in an apocalypse world game. They were going to a new city, and I said, "All right, everybody has one of the following um, in this city." Uh, uh, pick, that just pick, sounds pick one. To begin with. Pick one. So it was like you have a rival, a best friend, a spurned lover, a guy who fixed your shit. A guy who you fix their shit, 
someone you owe something to or someone who owes you something, go, pick one. And everybody picks one, and uh, and we go from there. And it's like, the dude who's owed something is going to go after it. It's like, wait a minute, you owe me money, you know? And it's like every, you know, it it gives the city something tangible. Like, we, we didn't... Like, train... Oh, no! Ah! We lost Judd! Wait, just back! Weird power right there. Oh, oh no. I yeah, summoned yeah. you. Here we go. Fight! Uh, I, yeah, I'm back. I, uh, <laughs> you so yeah, like just give, give, uh, give a little bit of structure. Like give them some, you know, a little bit of, you know, just a, as I said, I think it's a lot like Rich's thing. Front load a question, just a little bit, and uh, give them enough to make something up about. Um, you can still. It doesn't mean that they're gonna make up the city. Like you can still play your GM games and like make up a full on city, but they just get to find their little finger toehold in there, and. Uh, it's cool. It gives, it gives it all a little detail, a little life. Other thing you can do is hand them a map, circle some locations, say, what are these? Oh, nice. And that's yeah. a little quick one you can do, too. Like, I'm going to use the bathroom and get a beer. What are these? I don't care what they are. Just make them up. You can tell me one's a brothel, the other one's an orphanage that burned to the ground, and the other one is a bank that secretly sells the used weapons of dead soldiers. Whatever. Just make it up. Nice. Um, but if I was going to say, if you... Let's it's a tough world for orphans. Look at the uh, look at the gaming world currently, and the things that are coming out just like in the last year or two. You have the new Marvel system that's come out, and the way that they handle XP totally different. Steal that thing, steal those milestones ideas, put them in a different game. Look at Dresden Files and how you build a city together, and how you build your characters. Don't use it all. Take some of those things next time you do character generation. Screw it. Don't even do it during character generation. You've been running a game for two years, it's getting dry. Pull some of those things out, make people do them. Do like 30 minutes to an hour of your first session. Get their brain working, get yours working. And then even look at the new Fantasy Flight system for Star Wars. That is almost 80% narrative. And it's driven between you and the player, and the player doing it as well. And look at Monty Cook's new system coming out. That thing is diceless for a GM. That is so hot, I can't even tell you. So look at those things and steal them, put them in your game. Your players don't like it. Maybe they shouldn't be at your table. Like if they don't want to try something new, maybe you got the wrong people. But I know that almost all my players are hesitant. They love their structured games. When I put something new in, they may not like it. You got to make them love it. And once they do, they'll never want it to go away. They'll want it there all the time. It's like ice cream. Hallelujah. Well, one thing that I've noticed is that um, if you have players that are like really attached to a particular system or way of doing things and you do push them out of their comfort zone, even with, as you suggest, incorporating even just a single mechanic or a single, not even a mechanic, just sort of a challenge to create, you really want to make sure that you don't screw them over with it because you want it to be something where it's like an unmitigated positive the first time you do it. Like you, at least the first time you do it, make it just be a straight up 100% good thing that happens. Don't draw from Cthulhu. Don't do that. Yeah, well, <laughs> sure, but I mean, I guess what I'm getting at is, like, if you, let's say that this is the first time we've used, and we're going to use Judd's example of, we come to a new town, and there's one of these five types of people in it, and uh, I say, oh, yeah, uh, there's a guy here that owes me something. Um, don't make it so that it's impossible for me to get what I'm owed. Like, I go and I get it, and I get it from the guy, and maybe I have to, you know, invest a little to get it, but it is whatever I'm owed. It's great. It's just what I wanted. It's just what I needed at this point in time. Then when we come to the next... The story, not the down. Exactly. Then when yeah. we come to the next situation, maybe then you can give me something mixed. Maybe now I'm into it. Now I really have... My mind is moving in that direction. Yes. But the first time you do it, make it good. All I'll tell good. this guy, if he's coming to Gen Con, uh, Wolfgang Bauer is having a panel with me and a few other veterans in the industry at 9 in the morning on Friday. And come in and ask your questions, man. We'll answer them there, too. Uh, I'm, I'm going to branch off of JD's thing and, and call that give them what they want. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, 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 a, that's another thing you can do to, to kill a drought. It's be like, oh, they've always wanted a castle? Um, they got a castle. They granted it. Like, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, more money, more problems. It's just the way it is, and it's, it's just do it. Give it to them. Give it to them, especially if they've earned it. I mean, really, give it to them if they've earned it. If they and a brood hollow them. Yeah, yeah. Give it to them. Give it to them. I've always wanted a. I've always wanted a. You know, 
give it to them. Give that to them, and and let them deal with those consequences and how much hard work it is. Yeah, they want a sphere of annihilation. Yeah. <laughs> give them a sphere them. of annihilation. Yeah. What yeah. do you do with it? There you go. I don't know. You it's true know. though. That's it's give them what they want. Sometimes yeah. they don't know what to do. It's it's phrased really beautifully in the in the game Sagas of the Icelanders, and it is uh how does he say it? It's really beautiful. He says something like, uh, "Promise them the sun, but give them the moon." <laughs> and, and, that's some song and, lyrics. Stuff and like to that. me, to yeah, me, no that's kidding. Not, <laughs> to me, that's that's not saying, uh, fuck with their wish and and make it toxic. It's no. saying give it to them. But show them the realities of it, you know. Mm -hmm. Show them that it's this is this is adventurous and this is difficult. Just because you have a castle doesn't mean the adventure ends. Like castles were there for a specific adventurous purpose. Now what? Um, so like usually protection from something horrible. Ding ding ding. If it's not locked in the castle, that's even to better. protect other people from something horrible, <laughs> yeah, not just that's you, true. not no just universe. you. It's not it's not yeah. a, because if it's just five people, just bury them in a hole somewhere. Right, right. right. What was you that? Need a lot more people. What was that movie, the the keep? And they're like, why are the walls bigger on the inside? That's not the way castles. Are. <laughs> <laughs> what show you? What's awesome. what's in the middle? What's what's trying to get out? Cool. So I'm just gonna read like off that. a bunch of things. Uh, when you're stuck and you don't know what to do, you can take a breather. You can look at the character sheets. You can ask questions. You can give consequences to past stuff. You can destroy a status quo. You can shift to a different point of view that gives uh, the game a different uh, different light. You can front load NPCs and ask questions. You can leave blanks that are meaningful uh, to front loading stuff. You can steal pieces of other games that create create fiction. You can uh, drop them in a situation in media res, and you can give them what they want. Good stuff. Awesome. That's, that's a pretty good damn list. So can I give my real quick cheat answer, John? Yes. Yeah, cheat. All right, so here, cheat. here's my cheat answer. You've completely psyched yourself out. All of these tips are not going to work for you for whatever reason, and that makes perfect sense to you, and that's okay. You don't have to defend it. But you still want to run something. So here's a list of some zero prep games that you could run as a one-shot. Now, I'm not going to mention Fiasco. Oh, wait, I just did. Um, Lady Blackbird, Siren, Inspectors, Shotgun Diaries, and Don't Rest Your Head. All inexpensive PDFs, uh, great games, very easy to make characters. You can get up and running in 15 minutes with any of them, play an entire night session, maybe teach them a few new tricks in the game, and uh, still keep the ball rolling. Yeah. People are still selling modules, too. To I mean, not to put too fine a point on it. Yeah. Makes them think when they go back to the game. There's a guy who uh, just sent me a message uh, on Twitter, one of the people watching on R&R, &R, and he's like, first one's free. Get them addicted. <laughs> it's, it's very true. That's very yeah, true. Yep, it's you got Westcott it. From, uh, he does the minis for Paizo right now. Pathfinder. Cool. Paizo. So, yeah, cool. it's just true, man. Give them one, make them want more. Yeah. And I think the, 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 there's always the red button option of going to your friends and being like, I don't like this game. I've got no ideas for it, and I don't know what to do with it, and I, have, I don't even know. Like, seriously, like, you can level with your friends and be like, I have no idea what to do with this damn thing. Like, seriously. Maybe one of them's a GM. Pass the buck for the night. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Hey, if you haven't prepped and you've got nothing on the horizon, that could be a sign. Yeah. 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 End all be all. If there's nothing left, there's always another game. Yes. Yeah. I'm in. Cool. All right. Cool. Good stuff. All right, Rich. So you've got the timer, right? I have the timer. Okay. Two minutes. Are we playing so a game we, show? Yes, yes, we are. So this is the part of the show where we talk about what we're into. Each of us has exactly two minutes where we talk about something that is exciting in our current game or in gaming in general uh, that we uh, just want to share with people. And we have to get it done within two minutes. When the two minutes is up, we have to stop talking. Who wants to go first? Who wants, who's first? I'll go I'll first. I never go first. Okay, Judd goes first. Ready? Yep. You're going. I, is, that, is that a go? Yeah. I, uh, I just got a PDF of the seclusion of the Oraphone of the Three Visions, which is Vincent, pa Vincent Baker 
uh, doing Lamentations of the Flame Princess, and JD is laughing because he was going to say the same damn thing. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, I just want to sit around and like make wizard towers all day. That's like all I want to do. Uh, I, it's just that's it. As I have no I have no desire to do anything. I had to drive to Jersey today, and I was like, but I can't make wizard towers while I'm driving to New Jersey. Why Why would I drive when I could take a train? Uh, I, I I have a, like a notebook and a, I printed out a PDF of a, a bunch of the pages so I could just sit around and make up stuff, and it is absolutely consuming me. That that, that is really really fun. Uh, also, uh, when I got home, um, my copies of where is it, Sorcerer and uh, Sorcerer Sword Soul and Sex have arrived. So that's got me pretty psyched. That's uh, one of the first indie games I got into, and uh, I definitely want to play a game of that. Where the demon is Satan, and uh, all of the all the demons that you summon are like deals you make with Satan. Uh, I don't know why I want to do that, but I totally do. And I don't even know who I would play that with, but I'll find somebody. Damn it, uh, somebody's gonna somebody's gonna play Satan and Sorcerer with me. And we lost him again. Just so I can make a thread that's that uh, an AP thread. Is everybody there? Want to give him right. 10 seconds Am on I the back? clock? All right. We'll give him 10 seconds back. Are you with All us, right. Judd? All right. Yeah, Last 10 seconds. Go. All right. Go. So, yeah. Satan, Sorcerer, Wizard Towers. I just want to, like, make shit up, play more games. And I don't have I don't have enough days in the week to play any more games. You've so got sex. That was in that book, too. Yes. Sex is fun. Done. <laughs> Done. With time to spare. But nobody gets it. <laughs> That's awesome. I want to make wizard towers all day long. Excellent. Good work. All right. Uh, I I can go next. Go, Rich. All right. Um, so just today, I had a fury of posts on one of the play-by-forum Apocalypse World games have been running for a while, which uh, consisted of um, a funeral for for a character for an NPC that was kind of important. And what was amazing about the setup for the for the character that died was that there was an ongoing battle between uh, the gun lugger player character and a whole group of um, not trained killers, more like union workers who were pissed off. So, uh, but there were a lot of them. So it got really deadly really fast. And the gun lugger was okay with lots of armor, but she happened to have hold up with her her partner. Uh, a a little kid who was kind of forced into prostitution and an ex-lover. And I said, guess what? One of them dies. Who is it? And she chose her partner, which blew my mind because this was like the love of her life. So, you know, I really had to have a good, strong reflection of that, right? It needed to have resonance. So I had to come up with eulogies from a series of NPCs and, like, some other events going on, a little bit of a reveal that answered one of the questions about their relationship. And it was just brilliant. And what was great was, you know, it was played by Forum, but I've got instant messages going back and forth with the player of, of Fox the Gunlugger. And she was like, I'm still crying for my character. This is horrible, but it's so amazing. So that was really great. And... Um, a couple weeks ago, I launched a game of Siren, um, which I mentioned earlier. It's a really excellent game. It's my first time playing it, and I had a really good time because one of the things is each player, you finish the game by each player who is, uh, who's lost their memory, they answer questions they have that you create as character generation. And a person had done something that would answer one of their questions, the other players have to answer that question. And it's over play by forum, so you know we're all learning the game. And first person kind of sort of answered it, but didn't really answer the question of like what it means. And I forced them into doing it. And it was great. Crap. <laughs> Alright, that was my two and twenty seconds. I took <laughs> at Judd's extra time. There we go. Sorry. I'm bad. All right, who's next? Uh, I'm ready. All right, and go. Okay, so uh, I also got a Kickstarter thing in the mail, which was the uh, Spark role-playing game by uh, Jason Piter, and I'm still absorbing that, but it does a lot of the collaborative things that we talked about today, especially things that Eric brought up from uh, Dresden Files. I would say that its setting creation system is very much like the city creation in Dresden in terms of how you collaborate with other people to pull the relevant pieces uh, out of it narratively. Um, so I'm excited about that, but I'm still kind of thinking it over. The game that I want to talk about is a 
game that is new to me because I, I never played it before. I got it on the Christmas in July sale uh, at RPG Now. It is a White Wolf game that I've never played, never read. It's from, I believe, 10 years ago. It's Demon the Forsaken. Now, Demon has this um, really unique sort of attitude towards redemption, although clearly Satan is on our minds today, uh, Judd. So um, I, I wanted to just kind of really bring up the idea that in the world of darkness, which is a horrible, horrible place, the concept behind a Demon is that the characters fell from heaven because they loved mankind too much. God was becoming too cruel, setting this world up to be this horrible, nasty, nightmarish place with death and misfortune and all kinds of things. And when he, um, and when he did these things, angels rebelled, like the characters. They were cast out into hell. Uh, there was a war between heaven and hell, and now they're returning to earth. And when you return to earth uh, in this uh, in this idea, you have to inhabit the body of a mortal who is broken in some way, either physically broken, like they were in a coma and their mind just isn't working properly, or maybe drugs have burned them out or a bad relationship or something. You fill sort of the hole in their self. But it's that broken, ah, mortal that... You idea of redemption. So there you go. Good job, Jason. Nice, Jason. What just happened now was me stalling to think while they all went. Yes. An example of that in play. Uh, no. I could tell. I'm sorry, but I could tell, Eric. I, I, I was actually ready. Um, and I asked to come with today, so ready? Ready to go? Yeah. Go. All right, so this morning I got to play a Pathfinder Society for the first time ever. Never got to play it. It's very regimented, more than I thought it would be. It was really, really deadly. Um, and we're looking at the maps, and I'm a big cartographer. I love doing maps, one of my favorite things to do. What I would like to do after talking today, I want to make a small book or PDF of maps that can be used for um, D20, uh, Roll, D Roll20 and for tabletop, where the players can help build either the city or the dungeon you're going into or the map, and somehow that ties into the player's background. Maybe like a 10, 15-page PDF with three maps in it. And these maps would have areas or areas you can circle and things you can highlight and what that will do for the players. So have it be, this tower was owned by a funeral director that died and his family died with him. And because of that, it somehow ties to the players. But these maps are going to be set up in layers. And they'll be the layer that the players decide, and then there'll be the layer that gets put over it for the GM. And that can be either translucent, like the old Ravenlofts, or if it's in D20, it can just be an extra layer. And I think with these, I want there to be a development with... Um, uh, character and GM interaction um, prior to gaming, but it, it gives the story for everything overall. So I think as we've talked today, there's a lack of hooks that GMs build into their players from the beginning. And Dresden Files does that, but I'd like to do something with maps, because I don't think I've ever seen it done with maps before. And they're such an integral part of everything we do, from tabletop to even White Wolf uses them to say, here's where you are, to our everyday life when we use maps when we drive around town. But I'm going to Something's going to happen. I'll say in the next 12 months. I'm going to put something together for it, maybe 10 pages cool. long, probably at the Gen Con. Um, I don't know if it's going to be called uh, Cartographer and You or something along those lines. That's it. I'm not even going to do two minutes. Yeah. Oh, that was so close. Good work. Nice. Hey, uh, Eric, have you looked at uh, Zero One uh, Productions maps? Is that the ones Zero like the one and all that stuff? I think I won exactly. one of the many years of Iron Chef. You you should check those out in the, in the PDF format, the electronic versions. Those are the ones I have in PDF. Because they use layers really well. Like you yeah. can, there's like a GM layer, there's a furniture layer, there's a grid layer. It, I want to do really something like is, that. Is pretty awesome. Yeah, but yeah I, I would definitely so check it out. Tied like maybe items. Uh, say say you do a campaign where everything's stolen from a group, and they all end up in this building. And those items are things that get laid over the, the map afterwards. Short adventure, something you can do in one session. More nice. like a, a cartography hooks kind of is the concept behind it. Nice. Neat. Cool. I like using uh, uh, urban geomorphs, too, and just put together a neighborhood yeah. and be like, this is your neighborhood. What's this street called? Oh, uh, I use Google Maps for that when we play yeah. Shadowrun. Oh, nice. So I just, and I just draw over top of it. Oh, very nice. I do a satellite view and I draw over, take a screenshot and draw over in Photoshop. We were running Cthulhu Tech, and I actually did that in Chicago. Cool, that's awesome. Sweet. 
Cool, guys. That was a lot of fun. Thank you. Eric, I hope you come back, like, every time, forever. Yeah, I would love to. It's, you guys do it on a very odd time for me, but I'm, I'm working something out to where maybe I can show up more frequently. Cool. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks for showing up. Yeah, for sure. I, I love it. It's, like, guys, it's a lot of fun. Cool. All right. Well, if any of you that are listening or watching have a, something good that happened in your game or something bad that you need help with, um, you can post it to our feed. You can post it here in the comments uh, of this video, and we'll pick it up and uh, talk about it next time. For sure. All right, and we're out. <laughs>